Hi everyone, welcome to lecture one of ECO 208. Um, so in this lecture it's really just introductory. We're going to talk about what is macroeconomics and where did it come from. And in particular, where did the strand of macro, the type of macro that we're going to be doing in this course, where did that come from? And what makes it different than other strands of macro? Um, and then we're going to talk about models what they are, what they're good for, why we use them, and finally I'm going to try to offer you a little bit of motivation about why you should be interested in a macro. And I'm going to do my best to tell you that you should be. So without further ado, let's get started with lecture one. So what is macroeconomics? Well, it's easiest to see uh, in contrast to the other major strand of economics, which is microeconomics. And so microeconomics is really concerned with the behavior of individual consumers or firms. So a microeconomist might ask something like, what determines the price of a given good? What determines the demand for a given good? And so these are really individual questions related to one small part of an economy. In contrast, macroeconomics is interested in the behavior of economic aggregates. So not a single good, but economy-wide variables. So to give you an example, macroeconomists might ask, what determines unemployment, which is an economy-wide variable? What determines inflation? So that's prices in general, not the price of a given good, but prices, the price level of the entire economy. What determines economic growth? or what determines business cycles, these ups and downs, these swings in business conditions or in employment uh, or in economic growth. Um, so to sort of show you where this comes from, let's talk a little bit about history. I'm going to give you the briefest summary of the history of economics. Um, so really kind of modern, what we think of as being modern economics starts, I put 1776 which is with the publication of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. Um, I also put a few other names there from the classical period, people like David Ricardo, Karl Marx, you might think Thomas Malthus. Um, and what were they interested in? Well, it was this early science at the time, and so they really had these broad interests. They talked about all kinds of things. If you look at the index or the table of contents for the Wealth of Nations, you'll see that Smith covers so many different things. Um, so they talk about economic growth. I mean, that's the first few chapters of Smith. Distribution between classes, what determines prices, just all kinds of things. No one had really settled down onto kind of the main focus of the discipline. And so as a result, they just talked about anything that might be an interest to them that related to the economy. In the 1800s, um, this kind of changed in what's called the marginalist period. So here again, I just put a few names for those of you who might be interested. You don't have to know these names, but <clears throat> just for interest's sake. Um, and the marginalists uh, really started what we think of as being modern microeconomics. So they were the ones who came up with these ideas of supply and demand or supply and demand curves, prices being determined by subjective valuation, so this is different than the classicals who thought that prices were determined by how much labor is in a good. So if it took two hours to make a chair and four hours to make a table, there's twice as much labor in a table, and so therefore a table should be twice as expensive. Well, the marginalists came along and said, you know, it's not really the best way of thinking about this. And they developed really what is modern microeconomics. So what you learn in uh, second year micro or even first year micro, this really came from the marginalists in this period. And so really they were concerned with these microeconomic questions about prices, about demand, about supply, things like that. Um, and this really all changed come the 1930s with the Great Depression. And in particular, here I put uh, John Maynard Keynes's general theory. Suddenly, it became really important to explain kind of economy-wide variables like GDP or the business cycle or unemployment. <clears throat> and this was sort of the main thrust of Keynes's general theory. And now it's not that people weren't looking at these uh, questions before. 
So for example, here I have William Stanley Jevons as one of the people from the marginalist period. He had theories talking about business cycles. He tried to link them to sunspots and to movements in the planets. But this wasn't the main thrust of economics during the marginalist period. Really, if you opened up a textbook at the time, an economics textbook, it was mainly about prices, supply and demand. And it was only in the 30s, and particularly with Keynes's general theory, where there was this sudden real interest in these macro variables, these economy-wide variables. <clears throat> and so I put here, what was Keynes, for example, interested in? Things like aggregate employment, interest rates, the amount of money in the economy. And this was really the birth of macroeconomics. <clears throat> and so after World War II in 1945, you had this real split into macroeconomists like Keynes and microeconomists like the marginalists. And these two different sections of the discipline who are looking at these separate aspects of economics. <clears throat> And so, from there, how do we get to what we're going to study today? Well, right after World War II, 1945, you have what I call post-war Keynesian macro. And this is really building off of what Keynes had in the general theory. <clears throat> so, again, I put a few names here. Some of them you might recognize. We're going to encounter at least one of them in our course, which is Robert Solow. Um, so what did they borrow from Keynes? They borrowed that unemployment is from insufficient aggregate demand. So it's a simple idea. It's that why is there unemployment? Well, there's unemployment because people aren't consuming enough stuff. They're not buying enough stuff. And so there is insufficient demand for employment. <clears throat> so that's one part of their theories. The other part is that their models were based on these macro equations. So in other words, they were equations that linked macro variables to macro variables. So I gave just some examples here. So for example, here I have, this is the Keynesian consumption function. So it says that consumption is some fraction alpha of total income y. Or likewise, saving is the opposite fraction of total income. <clears throat> or you can think of money demand is some equation <coughs> that links income on the interest rate i. <clears throat> But notice that these are what we would call reduced forms. So this alpha uh, isn't coming from any decisions by individual agents. We're just saying consumption is some fraction of income. Maybe we can measure what that, that fraction is, but we're not building this from the ground up. We're not building it from the, the uh, decisions of individual agents. And so in 1976, again, this is an arbitrary date, but around this time, we have the birth of uh, what's known as new classical macroeconomics. And so again, I put a few names here. Robert Lucas, we're going to talk about him in a second. Ed Prescott, Finn, Finn Kidland. And they really turned those two assumptions or those two features of post-war Keynesian macro on their head. So they're going to essentially say the opposite on both counts. So in one case, these economists say, Changes in employment are rational. So it's not that there's insufficient aggregate demand or something like that. It's that the changes in employment we see are the result of workers choosing not to work. It's that now, say, for example, the wage is lower than what I want to work at, and so I'm just choosing not to work. So it's not unemployment per se. It's changes in employment, which are being determined rationally by workers making these choices. But most importantly for our course is they started to rely on micro foundations. So decisions are going to be based on microeconomic optimization. These models are going to be built from the ground up. And we'll talk more about this in a second. But they're going to be built from uh, first principles of consumers and firms making optimal choices under constraints, much like what you might see in microeconomics. So decisions are not just going to be ad hoc, like this consumption function, which just says I consume some fraction, arbitrary fraction alpha of my income. My choice of consumption is going to be determined by a maximization problem. And so again, we'll talk more about this in a second. Finally, there was this reaction to this not long after, 
which was referred to as New Keynesian macroeconomics. And again, I put some names here. Again, you don't have to memorize them or anything, but for those of you who are interested. So in here, I put Stanley Fisher, Janet Yellen, who uh, until recently was the head of the Federal Reserve, or David Romer. Um, and what did these guys say, or these people, I should say, these men and women? They said, yes, micro foundations, we agree. We should build these, these models from micro foundations. They should be built from the ground up. But we don't believe that employment is, changes in employment are rational. We do believe that unemployment is involuntary and due to changes in aggregate demand. And the way they're going to get those changes is due to sticky prices. So in other words, the reason why labor markets aren't clearing at any point is that the wages aren't adjusting to clear the labor market. And if that doesn't make sense immediately, that's okay. We're going to go to it in detail uh, in the, throughout the course. But importantly for us is that <clears throat> the brand of economics we're going to be focusing on is that brand with micro foundations. So this course really looks at new classical economics and new Keynesian economics. So we're going to be looking at models that have micro foundations that are built from the ground up, that are built starting with microeconomic optimization by firms and consumers. We're not going to be dealing with what I called here post-war Keynesian economics. And this section here, micro, the micro founded section, so new classical and new Keynesian, is what we refer to as modern macro. So modern macro includes both new classical and new Keynesian. And again, what defines modern macro is these micro foundations, building these models from the ground up, building them from optimization at the consumer and firm level. And this was initiated by Robert Lucas, one of those names we saw earlier, in what's referred to as the Lucas Critique. So what was the Lucas Critique? Like I said, it's that models should be built from the bottom up, i.e. they should have micro foundations. So individual and firm decisions should be derived as the result of maximizing behavior. So why? Why is this important? I mean, it might seem reasonable, but in particular, why does it matter? So <laughs> the argument is as follows. Consider the Keynesian consumption function. You could consider many numbers of things from this post-war Keynesian economics, or even maybe from modern economics, but consider, for an example, the Keynesian consumption function. So the Keynesian consumption function says, I consume some fraction of my disposable income. So that's y minus t, where t is taxes. So we could estimate this alpha, we could run some econometrics, we could figure out what this alpha is, you know, on average, how much of people's disposable income do they consume? Uh, but how do we know it'll stay the same over time? You might imagine that we estimated on data from, say, 1990 to 2000, but that doesn't mean that people are going to be behaving in the same way today, because many things have changed since that 10 years between 1990 and 2000. There have been all kinds of changes in policy, for example, and these might affect this alpha. And so this is my point here, will different policies affect alpha? And so in theory, micro foundations allow for such parameters to be endogenous. So we're not just setting them arbitrarily, but we're allowing them to arise out of optimization, out of maximization by these individual agents. So like I said before, they're going to be determined by optimization problems by consumers or by firms. We're not just going to set them exogenously. The only exogenous parameters we have are going to be fundamentals. So this is things like preferences or technology parameters. And importantly, these are parameters or variables which do not change with policy. So though this alpha might change with policy, there might be changes in policy that lead me to consume more now, for example, because I believe that taxes will go up in the future. Or alternatively, I want to consume more now because the interest rate has changed, something like that. <clears throat> so these uh, variables will now be determined endogenously, and the only exogenous parameters, as I said, are these fundamentals, things that don't change with policy.